Last time we introduced the idea of a normal subgroup and quotient groups, and we gave a couple reasons why normal subgroups matter. Today we're going to continue talking about normal subgroups, uh, finding new properties as well as introducing what's called the normalizer of a group or of a subgroup and centralizers as well. And then we're going to proceed to give what I was calling the third reason for why normal subgroups are significant. The first reason was supposed to be they help us detect whether a group is isomorphic to a direct product group. The second one was that they allow us to form quotient groups. And the third one is that both normal subgroups and quotient groups play very nice with homomorphisms as we shall see today. Since we've already defined normal subgroups, let's start with the theorem. So if G is a group with K and N both subgroups of G, and in particular N normal in G, then the following statements are true. First, uh, the intersection of N and K is normal in K. Recall that the intersection of two subgroups is itself a subgroup. We're saying that this one is normal inside that one. Number two, N is normal in the join of N and K. I might have briefly mentioned the join before. This also goes by the notation N join K in that way. And this is exactly the set of all products uh, nk, little nk, where n is an element of the subgroup n and little k is an element of the subgroup big K, right? So n is normal in the join of the two subgroups. Number three, the join is uh, sort of commutative. And lastly, if k is also normal in the group G, and the intersection of K and N is just the identity element, or the trivial group if you like, then uh, element-wise, NK equals KN for all elements of the normal subgroup N and the normal subgroup K. To prove the first statement, let A be an element, an arbitrary element, in the intersection of N and K and let little k be an arbitrary element of the subgroup k. Now what we want to show is that for all such arbitrary k and a, that k a k inverse is in n intersect k, right? So what are we going to do? Well, let's first show that it's in k and then show that it's in n. So K A K inverse is in the subgroup K because A is in the intersection of N and K and so by definition it's also in K. Now K is a subgroup so it's closed under multiplication so we have three elements of K multiplied together that's going to give us another element of the subgroup K. Alright now we need to show that it's in N as well. So if we look at this element this is k multiplying an element of n, right? So this is contained in the coset kn. Now, since n is normal in G, kn is equal to nk, right? So that means that there exists some a prime in n such that ka is equal to uh, a prime k for the same k value, or the same k element rather, and thus we can write k a as, or k a k inverse as um, a prime k k inverse, and now we can just do inverse stuff, a prime e is equal to a prime, and a prime by definition was an element of the normal subgroup n, Thus, this product is also an N. Now, if this K, A, K inverse is in both K and in N, then it is in the intersection of them as well. 
for arbitrary k and a, so that n intersect k is indeed normal in k. To prove the second statement, we're going to do the same thing essentially. So let little n be an arbitrary element of the subgroup n and let um, b, we'll call that, be an element of the join of n and k. All right, so that means that b can be written as some eta kappa for um, some eta in the normal subgroup n and kappa in the subgroup k. So then we want to see if b and b inverse is in the normal subgroup n. So to figure this out, we substitute, so this is gonna be equal to eta kappa times n times uh, eta kappa inverse. And of course we have generalized associativity in this group is equal to eta, I'm gonna put parenthesis here, kappa n, this flips the order, so kappa inverse times eta inverse. Now, since n is a normal subgroup of G, this is not necessarily equal to little n, but it's going to be in the normal subgroup capital N. So we'll just call it equal to n prime. So this is going to be equal to n, uh, eta times n prime times eta inverse, and all three of these are elements of the normal subgroup n. And since it's closed, this is going to be also in the normal subgroup n. Thus, we have shown that B and B inverse for arbitrary B in the joint of N and K and N in the normal subgroup N uh, is also in the normal subgroup N so that N is normal in the joint of N and K. Next, we're going to show that you can form the joint in two ways, but when N is normal in G, the two are in fact equivalent. So, let X be an arbitrary element in this particular uh, subgroup of G, then that means there have to exist N and K, right? N in the sub subgroup N and K in subgroup K, such that X is equal to N K, right? This is the definition of the join. Well, we also know that since N is normal in G, that when, whenever we have a product N K like this, there exists another element, we'll call it eta, in the normal subgroup n, such that nk is equal to k eta for the same k, right? This is the definition, at least element-wise, of the normal subgroup. So, uh, and then straightforward here, I mean, this is uh, also by definition in kn, right? So now we've shown that an arbitrary element of nk is in kn, and we use the fact that n was normal, of course. Since an arbitrary element of nk is in kn, then we know that nk is contained in kn. Likewise, what we can do is pick an arbitrary element of kn and do the same exact argument to show that kn is contained in nk, and when the two are contained in one another, then they are equal. Lastly, we said that if k is normal in G as well, and the intersection of normal subgroups k and n is just the identity element, then element-wise, uh, the two groups commute. To prove this, let's let nk be an arbitrary uh, product of arbitrary elements from n and k, right? Now, we know that uh, since N and K, the groups, are normal in G, that there must exist eta in the normal subgroup N and kappa in the normal subgroup K, such that N K is equal to kappa N, and also, nk is equal to k eta, right? These are uh, these two equations come out of the two normal subgroups that we have. Element-wise definition of normal subgroups is being utilized once again. So, <clears throat> 
Transitively, we have that kappa n is equal to k eta, right? Now, because this is a group, we can multiply by inverses and we get that uh, k inverse kappa is equal to eta n inverse, right? This is just rearranging this equation. So, now k and kappa are both elements of the subgroup k, and it's a subgroup, so it's closed, which means that this side is in k, and likewise, n is closed, so this side is in n. But since the two are equal, clearly whatever these two products are, they have to be contained in both uh, k and n. Now, if k intersect n is just the identity element, then that me must mean that kappa k inverse is equal to, uh, or k inverse kappa rather, is equal to the identity element. Likewise, eta n inverse is equal to the identity element. All right, since k and kappa inverse multiply to be the identity, then these two are inverses, and you can conclude that k is equal to kappa by uniqueness of inverses. Likewise, we can conclude that eta is equal to n, and that means that if we choose one of these statements, we get nk is equal to kn. Since this is true for arbitrary k and n, um, we have our statement. So with these properties that we just proved, it's not immediately obvious why they are significant. Yes, they're true, but do they really matter or are they just obscure, um, unintuitive properties about normal subgroups? Well, I won't give too much commentary, but as far as that last property goes, it actually is quite significant. It generalizes to families of normal subgroups in such a way that one can detect whether a group G, say, is the internal weak direct product of its normal subgroups. So it's important to classification and understanding the structure of groups. All right, our next theorem is that the center of a group is normal inside that group. We talked briefly about the center before. Um, Recall that the center of a group G is equal to the set of all elements in the group which commute with every other element in the group. Sometimes it also goes by Z of G for short. You'll also see this. But for consistency, I'm just going to use C here. And we're going to use them to mean the same thing, so it's fine. The proof is very simple. Let x be in the center of the group G. Then for all elements in, uh, we'll say G in the group G, we have the following. We have G x G inverse is going to be equal to x G G inverse, right? This is equal to this because x commutes with every element of the group. By definition, it's in the center, and this is equal to x uh, times the identity is equal to x, and obviously x itself is going to be in the center by, by supposition. So in some sense, it's, uh, it's trivially normal in the group, just like we had abelian groups having trivially normal subgroups. Now don't get intimidated, but we need to introduce some new terms that are all related deeply to the concept of normal subgroup. So first we have um, the centralizer of X and H. So if G is a group, and H and K are both subgroups of G, and of course X is an arbitrary element of the group G, then the centralizer of X in the subgroup H, denoted as C sub H of X is defined, defined as the set of all elements of H, the subgroup H, which commute um, 
with the element x. Similarly, we can define the centralizer of a subgroup in the group. And this is denoted C sub G of H. And it is defined to be exactly those elements in G which uh, commute with every element of H. So for all H in the subgroup H. Now the reason that these are both called centralizers and that they really are the same concept is that we're considering element-wise commutativity here. This is going to be different when we talk about the normalizer, but right here we have the centralizer of, of X and H is all those elements of the subgroup H, right, which commute with X. Here, similarly here, we want all those elements which commute with, with H only for every element of the subgroup, which is in the parentheses. So they really are the same concept, and it lies in the fact that we're talking about element-wise commutativity. Now we consider the normalizer of the subgroup K in the subgroup H. So N sub uh, H of K is the way we're going to denote this. And this is defined as the set of all elements in H such that uh, conjugation by H leaves the subgroup unchanged. Equivalently, you could say that we're talking about coset commutativity, right? So in, te in terms of uh, uh, the commutative property, centralizers are emphasizing element-wise commutativity, whereas the normalizer is looking at the question of whether cosets commute, right? Is the left coset equal to the right coset? Equivalently, does conjugation by an element leave this subgroup unchanged? And the set of all elements in H, the subgroup H, of course, for which this is true, is the normalizer of K in the subgroup H. We also speak of the normalizer of K, and in this case, it's the same thing that's happening here, only we just set H equal to G. So we're concerned with all the elements in the overall group, which uh, commute as cosets, with the subgroup K, or equivalently, that all those elements which leave it unchanged under conjugation by that element. So we don't just call it, uh, we don't call it normalizer of K in G, really, we just call it the normalizer of K. Now once again, it's not immediately obvious why we introduce these concepts, and it can be a little bit confusing at first because of how similar the definitions are. So we're going to play around with normalizers and centralizers a little bit, and hopefully, uh, the aim of this will be to gain a deeper understanding of what normal subgroups and quotient groups are and how they interact. That is our goal. So toward that end, we're going to do some examples and then prove a bunch of elementary properties of normalizers and centralizers. All right, we're going to start with the latter by introducing a bunch of elementary properties of normalizers and centralizers. Now, there's no way that I have time to prove all of these in full rigor, but we will demonstrate a few of them uh, and try to give an intuitive explanation for the rest. One thing I might have forgot to mention is that normalizers and centralizers are both, in their different manifestations, subgroups. So the first pr uh, fact I want to prove is that uh, the centralizer of X and H is a subgroup of the centralizer of X and G, where we're using the same notation as before, so that uh, X is an arbitrary element of G and K and H are subgroups of G. So to see that this is true, it's pretty simple. Any element of H, which commutes with X, is also an element of G, which commutes with X, since H is a subgroup of G. Now, there may also be elements in G which are not in H, which commute with X. Hence, both being subgroups of G, this must be contained in that one, and thus must be a subgroup of that group. So the next thing I want to show is that the centralizer of K and H is equal to the intersection of all the centralizers of X and H for elements X in the subgroup K. So to see that this is true, all we have to know is that this is all the elements in H which commute with a particular X, right? So in order to be in this subgroup, one must first be in this subgroup for a given 
x, right? But there may be some elements of the subgroup H which commute with certain elements of K, but not others, right? So those have to get knocked out. This is why we take the intersection of all these centralizers across all elements of K. It's the common set of elements of H which commute with every single element in K. So really it's sort of, it's almost a definition. It's an, it's an elementary property. Next, the centralizer of G in itself is equal to the center of G. Now this is again just a definition thing, but we want to connect all these various concepts and see how they're related. Well, the, the centralizer of G and G is by definition all those elements of G which commute with every element of G. Of course, this is how we define the center of a group. Alright, now the center of a group G is equal to the intersection of all the centralizers of its elements, right, ranging across the whole group. And this is just the result of these two statements, right? If this is the center, and then we set H and K both equal to G, then this statement yields this statement. And in particular, what I want to draw your attention to is that a single centralizer, so a centralizer of a single element in the group, may be a, we'll say for all intents and purposes, large set. But the center is the intersection of a bunch of these elements, right? The bigger the group is, the more intersections there are. And so you get that the center of a group is often a very, very small subgroup. This, I think, is important organizationally as it helps us visualize where the center is at in the group, right? It commutes with everything, but it's also a very small subgroup. Now, if K is not just a subgroup of G, but also a subgroup of H, so we have K in H in G, then the centralizer of H in G is a subgroup of the centralizer of K in G. And again, I want you to think about this center being a very small group, right? And when we take intersections of things, the set must be, the intersection set must be no larger than any constituent set, but very often it is much smaller than any of them. So that uh, we actually reverse the order here. So if K is a smaller group than H, it will have a bigger centralizer that will contain the other one. In particular, if you form a chain, we haven't talked about chains of subgroups, but this is something that one does. If you had G containing the subgroup H1, containing the subgroup H2, containing etc., uh, then what we would get is another chain of subgroups with inclusions, right, where the center of G is the smallest and it is contained in the centralizer of H1 and G, and both of those are contained in the centralizer of H2 in G. And you see this, this cascading chain of containment as far as centralizers go. So containment uh, or chains of subgroups imply chains of centralizers. And again, I think this is really valuable knowledge organizationally. Picturing where the centralizers are in the group, visualizing it and thinking about their relationship to one another. All right, next statement. Uh, the subgroup H is always normal, always in this, the normalizer of H and G. This is in fact why we call it the normalizer. So all you have to see here is that this is the set of all elements in G which uh, for which uh, HG is equal to GH, right? It commutes as cosets or you can think of it as conjugation, whatever you like. Well, we showed before last time that HG equals GH. The question, when is the left coset also equal to its right coset counterpart, that this only happens when H is normal, right? So the set of all elements in the group G for which this is true is essentially building up the largest subgroup in G for which H is normal in that subgroup. And this is why we call it the normalizer because it's the largest subgroup of the group G, it may be the group G, uh, for which H is normal in that subgroup. And this has as a corollary that if NG of H is equal to G, right, if the 
the largest subgroup for which H is normal in that subgroup is the group, then of course this would imply that H is normal in the group, right? So normalizers are really capturing uh, the normality, but on a more detailed level than just the definition of normal subgroup. All right, this next one is a little bit tricky, so I'll actually prove it. So if H is normal in G, then the centralizer of H and G is also normal in G. Now to show this, recall that uh, it's the same procedure. We let X be an arbitrary element of the centralizer of H in G, and let's let A be an arbitrary element of the group G. Then we want to look at um, AX, A inverse, and we want to show that this is in the centralizer of H and G. Now in order to show this, that would mean by definition of the centralizer that this element commutes with every element in H. In other words, AX, A inverse times H times AX, A inverse, inverse, we would want this product to equal this element H for all H in the subgroup G. Is this true? Well, we have generalized associativity, so we can, uh, well, I guess we can't erase that one. We can erase these, and then we distribute the inverse, right? And it's gonna flip the order and give everything an inverse, and when you do that, all it's going to change is that's going to be x inverse there. Now I want to regroup here in terms of a inverse h a. Now since h is normal in g for any element a in g, a inverse times h times a has to also be in h, right? That's part of the definition of the, the normal subgroup h. So if this is in h, then that means the following. X we assumed was in the centralizer of H and G, which means that it, by definition, commutes with what's in the parentheses. It commutes with any element from H, right? Which means we can switch the order, and this is equal to A times A inverse, uh, or A times A inverse H A, if you like, times X, X inverse A inverse. Now, if you uh, reorder parentheses, we have a uh, cancellation there, and we're gonna have a cancellation here, and then after we multiply by the identity, we're gonna have another cancellation here, and this is indeed going to be H. Since this product is H, AXA does indeed commute with arbitrary elements of the subgroup H, and thus it is contained in the centralizer of H and G, meaning that since A and X are arbitrary, the centralizer of H and G is normal in the group G. So as our last little fun fact about centralizers and normalizers, uh, if K is a subgroup of H and H is in turn a subgroup of G, then the centralizer of K and H is normal inside the normalizer of K and H. This is very important. So to prove this, we're going to make the same argument we made a minute ago, basically. So let x be an element of the centralizer of k and h, and let y be an arbitrary element of this, the normalizer of k and h. Then, in order to show that, well, that y, x, y inverse is in the centralizer of k and h, which is what we need in order for this normality relationship, to hold, <clears throat> we need y, x, y inverse to commute with every element of k. Right? So if little k um, is just an arbitrary element of the subgroup k, then we want to show that this is equal to that element k. And we're going to make the same argument as before. We're going to distribute this, uh, this inverse and then we're going to group terms separately. Now since y is an element of the normalizer of k and h, we have that, um, just from a minute ago, that k is always normal in the normalizer of k and h, which implies that this, 
This y inverse ky is another element of k, right? So if that's true, and x is the set of all elements in H which commute with every element of k, that means that x and y inverse ky, those two elements must commute. So this means we're gonna have this as being y times y inverse ky times x, x inverse y inverse, and once again, we're gonna get all these cancellations and this is gonna be equal to the element k, which means that indeed, uh, this element, y, x, y inverse, commutes with every element of the subgroup k and thus is contained in the centralizer of k and h, and thus the centralizer is normal in the normalizer. <laughs> now the consequences of a, the centralizer of a subgroup being normal in the normalizer of that subgroup with respect, of course, to the same other subgroup is that we can take a quotient between these two. And this is extremely important and uh, in some ways characterizes the relationship between centralizers and normalizers, beside the fact earlier that we talked about element-wise versus coset operations. This other relationship is that we can take the quotient group it's always well defined. All right, now we are going to do an example involving normalizers and centralizers. So last time we introduced the quaternion group, right, containing these eight elements. And I'd like you to consider this subgroup, which I'm calling K, which is just these four elements. And first, let's find the centralizer of K and H. Well, we're looking for all the elements of H which commute with every element of K. So plus or minus J and plus or minus K are gonna be out because I times J is not equal to J times I, same with I and K. So we're restricted to these four elements. Okay, so positive one is obviously going to commute uh, negative one, and in fact the complex numbers of which these are a small subset, or at least isomorphic to um, some of the unit complex numbers, uh, they are commutative, is what I was going to say. So, looks like centralizer of k and h is going to be equal to none other than k itself. Now what's the normalizer of k and h? Well, of course, we're looking for all those elements A such that uh, A K A inverse is equal to K, right? Now, we have an issue with, uh, with commutativity here because not everything's commutative, but if you allow commutativity up to a sign change, then everything is commutative, which means that essentially we can say uh, the A K A inverse is equal to uh, plus or minus a a inverse k right is equal to uh, plus or minus k essentially so if we don't care about signs then we have for each of these uh, four elements their their negative is also in k and we just showed that the centralizer is always normal in the normalizer and as a corollary in this case k is normal in h which means we can take the quotient group h quotient k. So let's do that. Let's take n sub h of k and quotient that by c sub h of k and see what we get. Alright, so what are our cosets here? Well, we're going to have uh, positive 1 times plus or minus 1 plus or minus i. This is just going to give us k back, right? Is equal to K, so 1 times K is equal to K. Also, because we don't care about these sign changes, negative 1 is also going to be, uh, negative 1 times K is going to be equal to K. Similarly, if we multiply I, or minus I for that matter, times K, we're going to get plus or minus I here, and plus or minus I times plus or minus I yields plus or minus 1. So we're going to get K back once again. Now, if we multiply j, plus or minus j, by uh, k, 
here we'll get plus or minus j, and here we'll get plus or minus k, just by the rules of quaternion multiplication. So that this is equal to plus or minus j, plus or minus k. Similarly, if we multiply plus or minus k times plus or minus 1, plus or minus i, right, ki is going to be equal to uh, j, and ik is going to be equal to negative j, so we're going to have a similar story, right? These, these two products are going to give you plus or minus k, and these products are going to give you plus or minus j. So this is equal to, once again, plus or minus j, plus or minus k, and that's all our elements. So we see that we get one of two cosets. We either get k back, or we get this other coset. So our quotient group is a group with only two elements, and up to isomorphism, of course, there's only one such group, right? So uh, the normalizer of k and h, where k is a subgroup of the quaternion group, quotiented by the centralizer of k and h, is isomorphic to none other than z2, a, a group we're very familiar with. Now there's something else here lurking that I'd like to bring to your attention. Something not entirely obvious. So as a multiplicative group, k is actually going to turn out to be isomorphic to z4. Right? There are only two, two different groups that, are, uh, that have four elements in them. z4 and the Klein 4 group, as we've talked about several times. And the question is, which one is this? Well, um, positive i times positive i, so times itself, is going to give you negative 1, which is not the multiplicative identity element. So you have uh, an element which doesn't square to the identity, which means this is definitely not the Klein 4 group, so by process of elimination, it's z4, up to isomorphism. Now, something we said a long time ago, as in, it was in the, oh man, it was in one of our first videos, is that the automorphism group, right, this, the group of all automorphisms or, or isomorphisms of Z onto itself, right, the automorphism group of Z4 is isomorphic to Z2. I don't know if you recall this. Recall that all isomorphisms send the identity to the identity, and in the case of Z4, it sends the element uh, 2 to itself, which only leaves 1 going to 1 and 3 to 3, and 1 to 3 and 3 to 1. You may recall this. And we showed, so <clears throat> that was how we showed that the automorphism group of Z4 is indeed isomorphic to Z2. Now, this is a highly non obvious fact, which is why I'm pointing it out. But whenever you have a normalizer quotiented by a centralizer, it's going to be isomorphic to a subgroup, I'll just put subgroup, of the automorphism group of K. And right, so the automorphism group of K in this case is Z2, and this quotient is also Z2. So in this case, the subgroup of the automorphism group is just the automorphism group, right? Uh, Having only two elements, it only has itself and the trivial group as subgroups. But anyway, uh, this is this is in general true that when you take a quotient by, of a normalizer by a centralizer, you get a subgroup of the automorphism group of this group K. So a little bit of an unexpected connection to something we learned much earlier in the course. All right, by now you should have a pretty good understanding of normalizers and centralizers and how they illuminate the properties of normal subgroups. They're deeply connected. Now, I said before that there was one more reason I wanted to discuss for why normal subgroups are important. I said they play really nice with homomorphisms. So for the rest of this, we're going to turn our attention to that relationship, and this is going to be a segue into the discussion next time of the group isomorphism theorems. All right, so next theorem. If f going from g to h is a homomorphism of groups, then the kernel of f is a normal subgroup of g. Recall that the kernel of f is the set of all elements of the domain g, which map to the identity element in h. So to prove this, it's fairly straightforward. 
let A be in the kernel of F and let G be an arbitrary element of our group G. Then G A G inverse, we want to consider this and then we want to consider specifically what that gets mapped to in H. So uh, because F is a homomorphism, right, is operation preserving, which means this is equal to F of G times F of A times F of G inverse. And we showed early on that F of G inverse for homomorphisms is F of G in parentheses inverse. Now f of a, since a is contained in the kernel of f, is just the identity element in h, which multiplied by either of these is just that element. So now we have f of g times its own inverse. This is going to be the identity in the group h. And thus, g a g inverse is contained in the kernel of f. Since this is true for all a in the kernel of f and g in the group g, we conclude soundly that the kernel of f is indeed normal in the group g. We just showed that group homomorphisms naturally induce normal subgroups via the kernel. So now that begs the question, does it work in the other direction? Do normal subgroups naturally induce group homomorphisms? And we're going to see that the answer is yes. So as a sort of converse, we have this theorem. If n is a normal subgroup of g, then pi, the map from g to g quotient n, given by pi of a is equal to the left coset of n in g by a, is an epimorphism with kernel n. Now clearly it's well defined as a map in terms of every input having an output, right? Cosets are totally A-OK. -okay. So what we want to show is that it is operation preserving, that it is onto, and that it has kernel N. So for the first thing, to show that it is, it is a homomorphism to begin with, is uh, pi of AB, so let's take arbitrary elements AB in the group G. By definition, this is equal to the coset AB times N. And since N is a normal subgroup, we said that multiplication of cosets in the way we would like it to be defined is well defined if and only if N is a normal subgroup. Since it is, then we can say that this is, this is totally okay to say this. And of course, by definition of pi, once again, this is equal to pi of a times pi of b, and hence <clears throat> it is indeed a homomorphism. All right, so our next order of business is going to be to show that this map is surjective, and hence an epimorphism. So for all elements x in the quotient group g quotient n, x, uh, well, there exists, we'll say, some element a in the group g such that x is equal to the left coset of n and g by a, right? This is the definition of the quotient group we're appealing to here, right? So its elements by definition are cosets and uh, we're taking it to be the left cosets in this case. And so there has to exist an element a that's producing that coset. Now there doesn't have to be a unique element which is doing this, right? In general, uh, many elements produce the same coset but there exists at least one, and we can choose any one we want. So since this must exist, <clears throat> we say that A is the preimage of AN, right? Pi inverse of AN is equal to A, and hence pi inverse of X is equal to A. So we call A the preimage of our, our arbitrary element of the quotient group X. And since this A has to exist and it maps by, to AN by the definition of pi, we claim that <clears throat> indeed this map is an onto mapping or surjective mapping. Now to show this last part, first we're going to let X be an arbitrary element of the kernel of pi, which means that X gets mapped to the identity coset, which is just the normal subgroup N. And we know from our previous studies that 
Congruence mod n is a congruence relation which partitions our group into disjoint congruence classes, right? So what we're looking for is all elements, uh, essentially the kernel is all elements which are congruent to the identity element under congruence mod n. And of course, congruence mod n means that if A is congruent to E, left congruent in this case, then A inverse E belongs to the normal subgroup N. Since the identity is in there, we can just multiply that out and that gives us A inverse is in N. N is closed, it has its own inverses, etc., etc. So A is in fact in N if A is congruent to the identity element mod N. In summary then, if X is in the kernel of pi, that x gets mapped to the identity coset, which further implies that x is in the normal subgroup n. In other words, the kernel of pi is contained in the normal subgroup n. So then going the other way, if we have an arbitrary element of the subgroup n, well, a coset of n by another element in n is just going to be the identity coset n. In other words, uh, it's going to get mapped to our identity element in our quotient group, which means that it is contained in the kernel of pi. So thus, n is contained in the kernel of pi. And since we have inclusions in both directions, we can soundly conclude that the kernel of the map pi is indeed the normal subgroup n. So we have an epimorphism with kernel n, just because n is normal in G. So the converse is in essence true. And this map pi, this well this type of map shows up so often that it has its own name. Pi just going sort of the natural extension from the group to the uh, set of all cosets, right, or the quotient group is going to be called the canonical or a canonical projection map because we are essentially projecting the group G onto the quotient group G quotient N. Now we are ready for our final and most important theorem of the day. This will pave the way for the isomorphism theorems next time. So, theorem. If F going from G to H is a group homomorphism and N is a normal subgroup of G contained in the kernel of F, then there exists a unique homomorphism F tilde going from the quotient G quotient N to H such that F tilde of A N, left coset of N and G by A, is equal to F of A for all elements A in the group G. Moreover, the image of F tilde is equal to the image of F. The kernel of F tilde is equal to the quotient of the kernel of F by N. And F tilde is an isomorphism if and only if F is an epimorphism and N is equal to the kernel of F. It's quite a mouthful. The last bit's mostly just consequences. Uh, this top part is this, the central uh, content of the, the theorem essentially says that if we consider our canonical projection map to be included in this mix, then um, this group homomorphism F and this normal subgroup N imply that there is a unique map F tilde, which is also a group homomorphism, which allows this diagram to commute. In other words, there exists a unique group homomorphism F tilde such that um, F tilde composed with the canonical projection map is equal to the, the group homomorphism F. All right, I drew a diagram for you so you don't get confused. You can refer back to that when you need to. And you may be wondering, doesn't this look a lot like a theorem we proved earlier in, I believe, the second video on homomorphisms? We called it a universal mapping property. And the answer is yes. In fact, the universal mapping property gets us sort of most of the content of this theorem. So what really is going on here that's different from there? Well, throwing normal subgroups into the mix 
changes it from there exists a group homomorphism from this to this to there exists a unique homomorphism from this to this, right? I said before that uh, in, in the general case, this homomorphism is not unique unless this is an isomorphism, and that's really not that much uh, valuable information. So, to prove our theorem, first we use the universal mapping property we proved. So by that, since this is an epimorphism and F is a homomorphism, there must exist at least one group homomorphism, we'll call it F tilde, from the quotient group to H. <clears throat> now, the real content of this theorem is, of course, the uniqueness. So, we need to prove that. So how does uniqueness normally fail? Well, it's possible that pi um, maps two elements to the same coset, right? But that F might uh, map those same two elements to two different elements in H, and then we're gonna have a problem. So what we wanna show is that that can't happen. So the way we're gonna do this is we're going to suppose Suppose that, that A is not equal to B, um, they're both elements of the group G, I'll say, and pi of A is equal to pi of B. In order for the map F tilde to be unique, what we need is for uh, pi of A equal to pi of B to imply that f of a is equal to f of b, right? And we need normal subgroups for this because this isn't the case without them. All right, so pi of a equals pi of b implies what? It implies that these two group elements get mapped to the same coset in the quotient group. In other words, if we're using left cosets, just for convention's sake, um, what we're going to have is that this, this implies that A is left congruent to B mod N, right? Now by definition of, of congruence mod N, this is uh, true whenever A inverse B is contained in the group N. Now what we want to consider is what is F of A inverse B? Well, n, we said a inverse b is in n, but n is by supposition contained in the kernel of f, which means that this element must get mapped to the identity in h, which I'll just denote e sub h, right? Well, we also know that f is a group homomorphism, so this is also equal to f of a inverse times f of b, and we know that f of a inverse is equal to f of a inverse, and so we have that these two elements multiplied together give the identity element in H. Now, we can do this again by considering right congruence, right? Uh, the quotient group, because we're talking about a normal subgroup, left cosets and right cosets coincide, which means that we can do the same argument for for uh, right cosets and thus right congruence, and then we would get the exact opposite statement so that we have that these two elements must indeed be the same element. So f of a must be equal to f of b. So pi of a equals pi of b. If we have two elements of g mapping to the same coset, then it has to be the case that f maps them to the same element in h. And that is where we get our uniqueness from. And the true content, the heart of the content here. All right, now since pi of a is equal to pi of b implies f of a is equal to f of b, and f tilde, which is guaranteed to exist, is a function, meaning it assigns one and only one output for every input, then it is intuitively very clear that the image of f is going to be the same as the image of f tilde. The kernel of f tilde is all the elements in this quotient group, such that f tilde of x is equal to the identity in h, right? Now, <clears throat> because of the way we've set things up here, right, f tilde of an for any left coset in this quotient group 
arbitrarily using left cosets again, <clears throat> is equal to f of a, right? These are defined in such a way as to always coincide. Thus, if, uh, thus x is only, uh, or rather xn, is in the kernel of f tilde, if and only if, x, the element x in the group G, is in the kernel of the homomorphism f. Thus we can see that for every x in the kernel of f, if we take the left coset in n and g by x, right, which is a member of the quotient group, this is going to give us an element of the kernel of f tilde. Likewise, for any element in g which gets mapped under the projection map to this coset, and this coset is in the kernel, we're going to have that such an element is in the kernel of f. So we see that the kernel of f tilde is exactly the set of all left cosets in the quotient group uh, created or generated, if you like, by those elements which map to the identity um, under f. As for the last statement, I'm going to pull a classic move and leave it to the reader, or I guess viewer in this case, as an exercise. Can you show that f tilde is an isomorphism if and only if f is an epimorphism and n is the kernel of f? All right, next time we are gonna build on that last theorem. We're gonna restate it, and then we're going to derive its consequences, and they're huge, right? So the group isomorphism theorems are a main topic in group theory and they are all corollaries of the theorem we just proved, which itself is very close to being a corollary of the universal mapping properties. So you see how far reaching that theorem was, even though we proved it so early on. So be looking forward to next time. I'll see you then.